We are excavating here in a hill in Israel called Armageddon, the place where, according to the New Testament, at the end of the days, all the armies of the world will gather for war. Armageddon is known in Hebrew as Megiddo. It is situated 50 miles north of the modern city of Tel Aviv and 12 miles from Nazareth. In ancient times, Megiddo guarded a highly strategic pass of the sea road via Maris, which leads into the fertile valley of Jezreel. For centuries, the main artery between two continents, Africa and Asia. It has been the scene of countless battles from warring hordes crisscrossing these continents. As long as the site of Megiddo held strategic importance in ancient civilizations, cities rose and fell upon it with monotonous regularity. It has now been abandoned for over 2,000 years, yet today the place is very important to archaeologists. The site contains the remains of 20 cities, one on top of the other. For this reason, it also attracted the attention of Professor Iga Ilya Din, director of the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, one of the world's foremost contemporary archaeologists. He has conducted excavations in some of the most important sites in the Holy Land. His finds have brought to light a wealth of information about biblical eras. A former chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces, he is able to combine military and archaeological expertise to piece together the clues found in the remains of these ancient sites. From Megiddo, I shall demonstrate to you how the archaeologists reconstruct life from the very distant past. For example, how from what looks to be a few stones can we reproduce a whole Canaanite city? How do I know that this structure was once a beautiful city gate which Solomon built? Although we have uncovered only a small fraction of the riddles of Megiddo, I can show you most interesting discoveries. But first of all, some elementary facts. In the semi-arid climate of the Holy Land, there is a scarcity of springs. Of those which do exist, few are situated near a natural hill, the height of which could offer security to its inhabitants. For that reason, people were attracted over the centuries to locations which contained these two elements necessary for their survival, water and security. Upon these sites, therefore, ancient peoples built their cities and villages. The fact that for many centuries, buildings were built of sun-dried mud bricks, such as even are used today in buildings in Arab villages, is responsible for the speedy collapse and decay of deserted cities destroyed by enemy attack or earthquake or plague. The city wall, usually built of sturdier material and of definitely stronger construction, prevented the debris from being completely washed away by the elements. Newcomers or survivors of the destruction would then level the debris of the previous city and begin construction of new buildings. It is this process of a city destroyed and a fresh one rebuilt on its remains, repeated over and over again for thousands of years, which has created this mound. The Bible calls it a tell. Herein lies the key to the ability of dating its remains, or at least its relative chronology. For example, a lower stratum or layer is older than the one above it.
The possibility of absolutely dating the remains of people who didn't write or whose writing on perishable papyrus did not survive is, of course, much more difficult. However, sometimes we do find dated uh, objects in the strata. For example, if we find a seal like that with the name of a known pharaoh or a pot, an imported pot, the date of which is known from its country of origin, like this one from the Roman period, then obviously the date of the stratum in which these objects were found is ascertained. Indeed, pottery is very important for the archaeologists. Because of its fragile nature, men had to produce it very continuously. And thus the shape of the vessel changed even within the periods themselves. This jug, for example, with the pierced handles and these bands, is typical of 3000 BC and 3000 BC only. While this jug, still within the general uh, period, has folded ledge handles, which do not appear a hundred years later. Or take, for example, this beautiful jar with the two colors, bichrom as we call it, with the birds. This is typical of the 16th century BC. Or again, if you take a look at these two jars with a strainer, we call them beer mugs, Philistine beer mugs. This one was found, in fact, in Megiddo, in the city which was destroyed by David. We call it the vase of Orpheus because it shows a man with a musical instrument leading animals. So each of them is different, and with the help of the differences, we can date the strata in which the pottery was found. Now to explain how the archaeologist begins his search for clues to past life on a tell. Basically, he digs from top to bottom, peeling off, as it were, one layer after another. The task, however, is much more complicated. Because of war, destruction, the reuse of stones and earthquakes, strata are rarely in clearly defined and regular layers. It must be emphasized that in order for an archaeologist to discover what lies below any given stratum or city, he must first destroy the area directly above. Clearly, if an archaeologist does not keep accurate and complete records of the stratum before he destroys it, it can never again be reconstructed, and its secrets will be lost forever. Therefore, every piece of pottery or other object discovered is put into labeled baskets, washed, cleaned, numbered, if possible glued together, and recorded. Every find, every foundation and room is photographed, plotted on maps, and entered into records. The fact that 20 cities were destroyed here in one way or another certainly suggests that this hill has witnessed some fierce battles. Indeed, the first known detailed description of any battle is the capture of Megiddo, as chronicled by the pharaoh Tatmos III when he spoke to his troops in the 15th century BC. Behold, all the foreign countries have been put in this town by the command of our god Ra on this day. Inasmuch as every prince of every northern country is shut up within it, for the capturing of Megiddo is the capturing of a thousand towns. Another city that received a terrific conflagration is city number six from the top. Whenever we reach it and we encounter this ashes, we know exactly where we are. We are in stratum six. This stratum was particularly rich with vessels still standing on the floors of the houses. And one gets the impression as if the people really fled away the moment the city was invaded. This city is covered by about a foot and a half of ashes, broken pottery and personal belongings with the brick burned red from heat. We believe that this is the city conquered and destroyed by David. King David, the monarch who first unified the nation of Israel, was known for his beautiful psalms, his ability to play musical instruments, and his military genius. Because of his lightning strike on this Canaanite town of Megiddo, 
its inhabitants had no time to evacuate their personal possessions. For example, we found hidden under the ashes of this floor a purse of, the wo of a woman stuffed with many objects like beads and bracelets. Even these little two objects, one a crouching a gazelle and the other one a small monkey holding one uh, hand on his ear like that and eating with the other hand an apple as if uh, Adam eats already the apple but still pretends he's not listening to the words of Eve. The earliest strata, of course, usually give up fewer secrets and are more difficult to piece together. Even so, using his records, the archaeologist begins to build the story of Atel. Around 3000 BC, a new race of people came to this area and they founded on the Virgin Rock here the first city of Megiddo. They've built also a temple facing the east towards the rising sun. They left behind almost no relics of their type of religion. In fact, the only thing which remains today is one wall of the temple with the original plaster, 5,000 years old, still intact. A few hundred years later, say 2500 BC, near the same area, a new group of people came and took over Megiddo. And they built this monumental structure, circular in shape and unique in its dimension, 30 feet by 30 feet. Several steps lead to the top of this nearly circular structure. What was the purpose of this building? Well, I think we can guess. Many fragments of bones of animals were found on top of it and in the vicinity. And because of its shape, most probably it was a high place or altar for sacrifice. Over 4,500 years old, this is the most ancient altar of its kind known in the Holy Land. Later strata have left many more clues to the nature of ancient pagan ritual. Around the 16th century BC, there was an influx of newcomers, the Canaanites, the Horites, the Jebusites, and all those nations who, according to the Bible, confronted Joshua and the Israelites in the 13th century BC. Their gods included a goddess of fertility, of which the prophets of the Bible hated so dearly. One of their lords, or Baals, was the god of war, mentioned in the Bible and identifiable by his cone-shaped helmet. Another goddess is easily recognizable because of her two curls. The Canaanites artisans even mass produced their gods. Here, for example, is an ancient stone mold, and here is a modern cast of bronze made of it. A model shrine such as this one, decorated with snakes, seems to have had some ritual purpose in their Holy of Holies. The obliteration of their cult, its temple, altars and so forth, is one of the main objects of Moses' command to the Israelites when about to enter the Holy Land. The various rulers of Megiddo, mostly anonymous, saw to it that they too, in addition to their gods in heaven, should have sumptuous palaces. Quite naturally, these were the places where the most beautiful treasures have been found. A very important treasure was found in a palace of the 12th century BC.
in these ivories, it may be observed that the king was an art collector. An ivory with the name of Egyptian pharaoh Ramses III dates this unique collection as early as the 12th century BC. From this plaque and other similar pictures, the archaeologist can reconstruct some features of a woman's life in the Canaanite and early Israelite periods. These unique little palettes seem to have been used for eye makeup. For jewelry, they wore earrings, necklaces, nose rings. The rich, of course, made them out of gold. For leisure, these Canaanite uh, citizens of Megiddo, numbering about 3,000, had all sorts of games, mostly played with a dice like that. It is interesting that in another site, a dice was found loaded, showing that human nature hasn't changed. And now I'm going to test your ability to follow a sophisticated archaeological problem in dating a city and the method I used in arriving at a solution. Here, in fact, the Bible and the spade combined together to produce an historical evidence. It all began with a short passage in the first book of Kings, chapter 9, which I'll read to you now. This is the account of the levy which King Solomon raised to build the house of the Lord, his own house, Milo, the wall of Jerusalem, Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer. Three cities whose locations had been known for some time. But which of the numerous strata on each site was really Solomon's? Yadin's goal was to find the authentic cities of Solomon. At Megiddo, Yadin began his research from previous finds. The early excavators of Megiddo uncovered above the stratum of the red bricks and ashes a big Israelite city, the foundations of which are here, together with a magnificent six-chambered, two-towered city gate, as well as a complex of stables. These stables, gates, and buildings seem to fit the biblical description of Solomon's wealth in horses. The earlier excavators confirmed that the city was built at approximately the time of Solomon's kingdom. They were convinced that this was indeed a fortified city of Solomon. For many years then, these have been known to the world as Solomon's stables. Because the biblical account stated that Solomon also built Hatzor and Gezer, Yadin expected to find a similar style of construction in the gates and walls of all three of these cities. He decided to excavate in Hatzor. In the tenth stratum down, he found a city. Dating of ceramic fragments and chronological analysis of the layer confirmed his views. This was Solomon's city. We found here a city gate identical in plan and dimension with the one at Megiddo. In fact, the similarity was so great that when only the contours began to appear, we boasted to our laborers and we said to them, you dig here, you'll find a chamber, you dig here, you'll find a wall. When our prophecies turned out to be true, the laborers looked at us as if we were magicians. But when the biblical passage was read to them, our prestige diminished. That of the Bible was higher than ever. The third city, Gezer, had already been excavated by a British archaeologist. Yadin knew that the excavator had not reported any Solomonic gate or city, such as existed in Megiddo and Hatzor. Nevertheless, because of the biblical passage, I decided to re-examine the excavation's report. And to my great surprise, here was a plan of a gatehouse and a wall and fortifications exactly like here in Hatzor, wrongly ascribed here to a different period. Later excavations in Gezer confirmed that this fortification too was a city gate built by Solomon in the 10th century BC. There was now indisputable evidence that these city gates, virtually identical, were built by Solomon. There was only one fly in the ointment. In Gezer, as well as here in Chatzor, the Solomon Gatehouse was connected to a casement wall behind me, two parallel walls, 
one inner and one here, the outer, divided into compartments, into casements or rooms. But in Megiddo, Solomon's Gate was connected to a much stronger and heavier wall. In brief, a solid wall with these insets and offsets to make it even stronger against attack. Here indeed, then, was a difficult problem. There was no doubt that this heavy solid wall in Megiddo was on the same level as the famous stables attributed to Solomon. The question then was, why would Solomon, who ruled Israel during an era of relative peace, build a stronger and different type of wall in Megiddo while building a casemate wall in Gezer and Hatzor? The only possibility which seemed conceivable to me was that the solid wall was not Solomon's and that his laid somewhere under it. To verify this possibility, I conducted three seasons of excavations here at Megiddo and the results were indeed startling. Under this solid wall, we found not only a casement wall, but also the foundation of this beautiful palace here. In fact, the group which is digging with me is further uncover the foundation of this wall. This meant that under the stratum of the stables and the solid wall lay the true Solomon's city. This meant also, alas, that the famous stables of Solomon were not his. The answer then was that a later king had built a new city and stables and stronger fortifications over the ashes of Solomon's city. But he had retained Solomon's beautiful city gate, causing archaeologists to attribute the wrong stratum to Solomon. If Hatzor, Megiddo, and Gezer had not been mentioned together in the Bible in connection with Solomon, the true cities of Solomon might never have been found. Actually, we know from the Bible that in the days of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, Egyptian pharaoh Shishak conquered and destroyed Megiddo. The city was later rebuilt, probably by King Ahab and his strong-willed wife, Jezebel. Credit then must go to Ahab for building the stables. There is perhaps no finer example in the history of archaeology of a biblical passage helping so much in the identification and dating of structures in the Holy Land. The rulers of every city were preoccupied with security against enemy attack. For this reason, also silos were built to store food for siege against an enemy who couldn't breach the walls, like this one, for instance, which was built by one of the kings of Israel. The most concern was the water supply. And in fact, here, one of the rulers of Megiddo built this magnificent walkway or gallery leading to the cave down there where Megiddo's spring was found. Since the unprotected walkway was outside the city walls, it would have been vulnerable to enemy attack. It may be surmised, therefore, that its builder lived in a time of peace, a clue to who might have built it. From the style of the dressing of the stones, which so were exactly cut and enabled to put these huge blocks together without any mortar, from the mason mark found here matched by those found elsewhere, from the peculiar methods of laying the stones, what we call stretchers and headers, all this confirmed that the surface approach was built in the times of Solomon. At a later date, 
another king devised a secret passage within the city walls to Megiddo's water supply. He built a complex underground water system consisting of a vertical shaft 75 feet deep and a slanting tunnel 150 feet long, conducting the water from the source toward the foot of the shaft. When this later king, probably again the security-minded Ahab, finished his tunnel, he blocked and concealed the cave's outside entrance so that no one outside the city walls, namely an enemy, could enter to poison or rechannel the water supply. Even with all these elaborate defense measures, Megiddo was not able to withstand siege indefinitely. The final fall of the northern state of Israel in 720 BC and subsequently the fall of Judea some 150 years later by the Babylonians brought also great destruction to Megiddo, Armageddon. By the time the book of Revelation was written, the mound of Megiddo was ruinous and derelict. This symbolic end to what was once a prosperous and strong city established the mood for the sorrow that the book of Revelation prophesied will come upon the whole world. <laughs>